Alrighty, welcome back to Bumblebee. I'm your host Teresa, and today we're back to talking torture. This time, the top 10 messed up punishments from the Tokugawa era, which is also called the Edo era, by the way. So don't get confused if I jump back and forth between the titles. Let's get messy. Number 10 is got your nose and your ears and a couple other limbs because ancient civilization globally shared the unique agreement in the removal of someone's nose, ears, or both as the punishment for a crime. Tokugawa era Japan is no different. While flogging was a common penalty for crimes such as thefts, fighting, public intoxication, etc., amputation of the nose or ears or both replaced flogging as a penalty very early in this time, which it didn't last. This period of Japan follows a particularly violent one, and in the time of Tokugawa, they repealed a lot and calmed a lot of the criminal punishment laws from before. Regardless, commit the crime and pay the fine with mutilation. People who experienced this punishment were socially marked for their crime and were banished from hiding it. No big deal for those those who had already been punished with exile in accompaniment of mutilation of their nose and ears. Female culprits of crimes that were punishable with mutilation, however, were never mutilated, but they were ordered to parade through the village naked, so I mean pick your poison. Speaking of a woman having to pick her poison, number 9 is the tobacco ordeal. This is one of the most fascinating trial and ordeal ordeals that I have come across in my time researching. While there isn't much information, what little there is is unique to say the least. So a woman who has committed a crime goes through trial and ordeal the way that a man would, but often has different and less visceral ordeals. A favored way was the tobacco ordeal. A woman would be made to smoke several pipes full of tobacco, and the ash of the pipe was to be put into a cup of water as she did. No ash was to be spilled anywhere but the cup. This water and ash combo would be mixed together by a finger or spoon, and once the woman has finished her appointed number of pipes, she would have to drink the full cup of water. It was believed any woman who could smoke the tobacco and drink the ash water without feeling sick or dizzy was an innocent woman. Anyone who could not was guilty. Guilty of being a normal person, because who is drinking out of an ash cup and not feeling like death after? But anyways. Number 8 is the world's uncoolest face tat. Your parents could be disappointed about that face tat you chose, but imagine how much more disappointed they would have been if it was a government issued one smack dab in the center of your forehead. Tattooing in Japan can be traced back to 14,000 BC to 300 AD, when they were believed to hold a mystical significance. Afterwards, the culture moved away from tattoos well until the Edo period, where it came back in a very different way. For some duration of the time, a stamp like forehead tattoo was the go-to punishment for a non-violent offender, like a thief, a loiterer, a vandal, whatever. It was classified as a type of corporal punishment like flogging was. Now, Usually it came with expulsion, which unlike exile doesn't kick you from the whole town, but it can kick you from your previous neighborhood. It was a fantastic record keeping tab, however, as the tattoos were chosen by each region and was unique to them, making criminals from other areas identifiable. In most societies, if a tattooed criminal reoffended, they did receive the death penalty. However, some of the civilizations had a three strikes then you're out system. In 1745, tattooing replaced the previously discussed facial mutilation as society became gentler and less bloodthirsty. This continued over the years with face tattooing changing to the less embarrassing and quite fashionable by today's standards arm tattoo. In 1872, the newly established government of Japan abolished the tattoo penalty for once and all. Let's get uncomfortable with number 7, the steak ordeal. This fun ordeal starts with two large vertical stakes driven into the ground, on one of Tokugawa's three execution grounds. There would be multiple sets of these stakes depending on the height and weight of accused facing the stakes. This is because the body was to be stretched taunt between the two stakes, tied by the wrist and the ankle joints. They start with the wrist to, sus to suspend the body and make it easier to tie the ankles, but once the victim was up on those stakes, their weight was all on them. Anyone tied up in this torturous fashion was forced to remain this way until they either confessed or, well, died somehow. Hanging by the hair of the head was another staking ordeal. Obviously this wasn't something doable for someone without long hair, but worry not, as long hair was cultivated between both sexes so there was never any shortage of torture options. While held aloft by two others, someone would tie the victim's long hair into a knot at the top of the stake frame. So once they're tied, they let the weight of the person all hang from that hair, until they confessed or something uncomfortable to imagine happens. So number 6 is going to make me even more 
nauseous. It's tendon cutting. This makes me very squeamish. I'm gonna go fast. A customary punishment before and during the Edoke was to cut the Achilles tendon of both feet. This was to maim a person for the rest of their life. No hunting, no working. Heck, it couldn't walk in most cases, and you lost muscle connectivity that even aided in hip motion. This punishment makes you depend solely on others for the necessity of life. Seeing as this was usually a punishment for manslaughter or a passion killing, your family would have very likely disowned you anyways, leaving you alone to figure this out. One documented account is of an old man who had to move his body by dragging his legs using his hands and carrying two small blocks of wood in each to protect them as he did. If your tendons were spared, it was only to be exiled from your home and city forever or to be executed. Anatsurushi is number five. The Japanese were incredibly determined to keep Christian colonialists out of their nation. They represented imperialism and they were known to be dangerous outsiders, bringing foreign diseases and unnecessary wars in politics. Essentially, they didn't come quietly, they came quite noisily and bossily, and the Japanese just weren't feeling that. Now, the method they chose actually turned out to be incredibly effective and withheld Christianity from the country for far longer than many others had. This is because it was a wildly brutal method. Anatsurushi was used in the 17th century to coerce Christians to recant their faith after entering Japan. Victims would be hung upside down, suspended by their feet, and often lowered into a hole, itself often filled with excrement at the bottom. A cut would be made in the forehead around the temple area in order to let the blood pressure decrease in the area around their head. The aim was to break their resolve, to renounce their faith, or they would eventually die. For this reason, one of their hands would be left free and exposed so they may signal upwards a willingness to recant. Both Japanese and Western Christians are known to have been submitted to this torture. Sometimes there was a doctor around just to resuscitate them so they can continue being tortured. They were also subjected to head down crucifixion and water crucifixion. Water style was carried out by putting an upside down cross at the shoreline low enough at the tide at low tide and waiting for the tide to rise so that the person would eventually drown. Christians were treated this way until 1873 when Christianity was finally allowed into Japan. And since we're already on the topic, number four is crucifixion. While it's unclear when crucifixion was introduced into Japan, likely 12th to 16th century, it had already had a 2000 year history when that when they did. So the Japanese added some of their own twists to it, as you heard previously with the mention of an upside down or a water crucifixion. It was one of the three executions reserved for the worst of offenders. Alongside beheading and hanging, sometimes the three punishments would be mixed and matched. For example, crimes against individuals of higher social status and against family members or one's master could result in beheading prior to crucifixion. Adultery, theft, and subterfuge are all crucible offenses as they threatened both the social and political order. The person to be crucified would be carried out on horseback nude, a lot adding to the humiliation of their sentence. He'd be poked and prodded with staffs by the assigned guards who would also carry a large banner with the person's name, offense, and punishment. Oh yeah, they aired your dirty laundry on the march to your grave. This route would also be set to pass the accused residence as well as the location of their crime scene. The accused was then tied at the execution site and when the cross was risen and mounted with the accused tied upon it, the guards used their staffs to spear him repeatedly until a final thrust to the throat for an ending blow. The boiling point is number three. Large cauldrons were used by the Japanese for boiling fish to retrieve oil, preparing rice, soups, and cooking people alive. This particular torture was a remnant of the warring states period that I've mentioned to come before Tokugawa. They were completely masochismic in that time period. The Tokugawa empire saw that and ended quite a few of these punishments because of it. But not at first. This is why I can tell you how the Tokugawa would fill these jumbo sized cauldrons with cold water and put it over a blazing fire. As the water began to warm, the accused would be told hop on in. What starts as an arguably nice toasty bath begins to boil. The accused is to remain in hot water until they confessed. Now this was only used as an ordeal when the judge and jury were very convinced of a person's guilt, but the person just wasn't fessing up. It could sometimes also constitute as a mode of punishment or execution. For example, an entire family in the 16th century were boiled alive in a gigantic bathtub as a punishment for a failed assassination. Another fun ordeal was using a pan of boiling water and having the accused dip their arm into it. If they refused to do it, they were assumed guilty. If they didn't got burned, they were also assumed guilty. Only if you could stick your arm in boiling water and come out unscathed are you innocent, because that makes sense. Number two, we pull the saw, or don't. 
don't will sound better in a second. So, like a few others on this list, the Tokugawa's let this torturous execution method from the past dynasty enter into theirs. However, they made some changes in the brutality of it. But before this change, this execution method allowed for an interactive experience. So, step right up, boys and girls. Who is twisted enough to slowly saw at the head of a man buried alive? In a book by Louis Freud regarding Japanese history, he describes the grisly execution of a samurai slash bounty hunter. The man had attempted to claim a bounty target, but missed his shot. While he had escaped, it wasn't for long. He was captured and identified, and he was sentenced to the pulling the saw. The man had been buried up to his neck, and a saw set up next to him, with the signboard inviting passerbys to cut at his neck, slowly hacking the men's head off alive. Now, traditionally, this saw is also placed close enough to the victim's throat that the accused, while buried alive, could make the decision to speed up the process if they really wanted to. But like I said, changes were made. Metal saws, they were replaced with bamboo ones. And rather than being used to actually saw off the living's heads as they once were, they were now simply put on public display next to the condemned person for periods of days prior to their execution by other means. And number one is the painful honor seppuku, which literally translates means self-disembowelment. So before I unpack that statement, there are two forms of this execution, voluntary and obligatory. Obligatory. Voluntary is pretty rare. Circumstances such as warriors defeated in battle awaiting execution by their enemies and not wanting the dishonor of that. Meanwhile, obligatory seppuku refers to the method of capital punishment for samurai to spare them the disgrace of being beheaded by a common executioner. This form of execution was ritualized as a result. Great emphasis is put on the proper performance of the ritual. It's to be carried out in the presence of one or more witnesses sent by an authority who had ha issued the execution. While kneeling, the samurai would take a small dagger or short sword from a small table placed before him. The proper method, developed over several centuries, was plunging this weapon into your left abdomen, drawing the blade up laterally to the right and then turning it upwards. A truly exemplary samurai would then remove the blade and push it into his sternum across the first cut and then up to pierce the throat. This is a brutally painful and extremely slow death to experience. Weirdly, for this twisted reason, it was favored by the warrior code used by the samurai as an effective way to demonstrate the courage, self-control, and strong resolve of the samurai and to prove the sincerity of purpose even when facing their own crimes. Women of the samurai class also committed ritual takings of lives, but instead of slicing the abdomen, they slashed their throat with a short sword or dagger. A little easier on the girlies, I guess. Congrats! We've made it to the end of another video. I hope you guys are enjoying the new history content we've been putting out and be sure to comment below what you want to see more of. Like and subscribe to see more and I'll see you guys next time.